Mirror, mirror on the wall, can I show you what's through the door? Hi, my name is Annie and I am the youngest child of the governors, Malcolm and Pat. As in the description, I believe that transparency is absolutely vital and absolutely paramount in what Governor's World is all about. And as I said, I guess as Governor's World was originally an idea that I came up with um, back in March of this year, I guess the first part of transparency starts with me and the reasons as to why Governor's World now exists. As I said, my name is Annie and I'm the youngest child of the Governors, Malcolm and Pat. Malcolm and Pat were publicans in the United Kingdom and they did that job for well over 20 years and were very very good at it and they retired and they got involved in all sorts of clubs and things after they hit retirement but they were always very very proud of being governors of the pub to a point where the breweries were actually going and asking them to go in and filter out the pubs that needed to be cleaned up a bit. But that's another story in Balamori. As I said, transparency is absolutely vital in Governor's World, especially with the idea behind it. It's myself, Annie, my daughter, Safia, and my niece, Bromwyn who are behind the ideas of Governor's World. Each one of us has a story to tell and each one of us believes that transparency is the best way forward. Because our success at getting at where we are today could be vital in helping somebody who needs to better the path of life that they're on for their own mental well-being. Mine started many, many years ago, back in the 1970s, an era where child sexual abuse was not spoken about, it wasn't widely acknowledged by anybody, and nine times out of ten, it was just the child had a wild imagination. I think if we could all put it down to having a wild imagination, then wild imaginations and wild dreams are just that, aren't they? They our imagination, their dreams, they're not real. But unfortunately, these sexual abuse experiences that people go through are real. And they are so damaging to people's lives that sometimes there are people out there who reach the point of no return because of the violation, how traumatized they feel because of experiences and situations that have happened to them. As I said, I grew up in an era where things like that weren't spoken to or about. And plans were put into place to keep protection going and keep the, the person away from myself. The person who, the, the man that did this to me was extremely well known to my family and had caused quite a number of incidences within the time period of him being known to the family. This abuse went on from the age of 11 through to the age of nearly 15. The last 
um, attempt that he tried and it was an attempt on that occasion due to the fact that we, my brother and I had traveled down to an area where we were due to stay, to say goodbye to some relatives and this person just happened to be in the same vicinity. They'd been out getting drunk as always and I'd come back to where we were all staying and instead of going into the bedroom that he was supposed to have gone into he tried to sexually assault me whilst I was still laid on the settee and my immediate older brother was on a camp bed just the other side of the settee He was very clumsy and not my brother, the, the man who was trying to abuse me. He was very clumsy and obviously being drunk made no attempt to hide any of his noise. And he not only stirred my brother awake, but he did actually stir the lady of the house awake. Um, to the point where she called us and asked what he was actually doing in the sitting room. He shouldn't be in the sitting room. And he was actually trying to get me to go down to the beach at half past two, three o'clock in the morning. And as I got older and looking back on it as an adult, you know, what were your intentions of getting a young 14-year-old girl down on the beach at that time of the night if it wasn't to rape her? After a, a few minutes of clumsy behaviour and falling over furniture, lights went on and he was escorted out of the room. Thankfully, my brother and I left the following day to go back to where we were actually living with my parents. And not long after that, there was an aeroplane flight booked that had a ticket for my brother and a ticket for myself. And we left the country that we were living in and we traveled to the UK. So no justice or reprimanding was done. I suddenly found myself in a country that I didn't know, people I didn't really know. without my parents and hearing that this particular person was now causing trouble for my parents and one of my siblings being so far away and not knowing what was going on and still being a child I kind of went off the rails Got labelled a bad child. Got labelled a lousy human. Kind of ostracised from the family. Because I was rebelling. Rebelling against what had happened to me. Not knowing how to deal with those emotions of not only what had happened to me and what he'd put me through, but also the anguish, the anxiety of whether or not we were ever going to see my parents again. Never been separated from them at that stage. Twelve weeks is a long period of time. 
at that age, and especially at that distance. We settled down to life in the UK and pretty soon schools were, the school I attended was calling my parents and telling them that there was a problem that needed to be sorted out, there was something wrong. And my parents were unfortunately not listening to what was being said by the school. Um, she had mentioned, so one of the teachers had mentioned something to my mother and my mum was absolutely adamant that things like that had never happened. And of course, in the society that we lived in back then, especially the country that we lived in back then, it was a very taboo subject. And when you're, if you were the parents of a child that was sexually abused, you had a feeling that society was looking down their nose at you for not protecting the child. Not looking down at the nose of the person that did it, but looking down the nose of the parents for not protecting. But I was safe because I was out of reach. But I still had all of these emotional turmoils going off inside of me and not knowing how to deal with them. You know, it's that age of teenagehood where you're not a child, you're not an adult. You're something in between and it's neither here nor there. Your emotions are all up in the air. And you <laughs> It's like a pick and mix. Only it's not the pick and mix that you ordered. But that experience that left me feeling traumatized like that have an effect on my life? Yes, it did. It also had effects on forthcoming relationships. It's something that happens. But you get choices in life. And it's down to you and the choices you make to whether you are able to get through and survive those experiences that the life, or the curveball of life throws at you. Life's roller coaster. I managed to sort my head out to a certain extent. And I say now to a certain extent. Looking back at it, at that time, I, I thought I was on the road of recovery and boom, I was full steam ahead. But I hadn't really dealt with it in the way that I should have dealt with it. And that is what has had the effect on how I dealt with things as life went on. I've been married twice, divorced twice. I am a mother of three children. I was in a long-term relationship with an amazing man. Um, an absolute and utter amazing man. Just the sound of his voice would set my heart missing beats and beating like it was going to fly out of my chest. <coughs> and we had a, a good life together. We had children and we we really gelled well. But we were a combination that upset manipulating people who wanted things 
their way. And this involved, <coughs> excuse me, this involved family members as well as close family members. This man and I are of two different cultures, but we didn't see the two different cultures. We saw two human beings bringing two cultures into one house and having the best of both worlds. But people got jealous of that. And also people are very, very reluctant still to this day to accept into relational re relationships and I never understood why especially when it's family members so here I found myself in another situation of being ostracized and spoken about and treated unfairly and disrespectfully because we had the audacity to have fallen in love. We coped quite well for seven years. And then my partner went back home and we had been receiving, due to somebody being here in the country, not legally, um, who had tried desperately since from the day that they had arrived to try and upset the smooth balance of our house. Um, it wasn't long after that that I was receiving telephone threats um, we were having knocks on the door in the middle of the night and these were things that were happening when my partner wasn't there and they escalated dreadfully in 2008 where I was actually run out of my house with my three children. It was either going to hide in with my three children or the prospect of landing up dead with my middle child whilst my youngest child had been kidnapped and flown out of the country. I tried to speak to members of the family, of his family, and I got shooed away. So f for 14 years, near on 14 years, there we were, running and hiding and <laughs> trying to live as positive a life as we possibly could. But during that time, I was actually put through a nervous breakdown where somebody that I believed that was supposed to be in for a good friendship came round to my property and threatened to kill me after I'd been kidnapped along with somebody I've known from a childhood friendship uh, we were both in the same country together and he was going to have us two kidnapped and tortured uh, this man stood in my kitchen and described horrifically and graphically of what was going to happen to me and then myself and this person who is now a vicar were going to be left to bleed out 
in an old disused warehouse and threatened that the person who was going to help him was somebody who was connected to the bandidos in France and the outlaws in the United Kingdom. You don't take those kind of threats lightly, especially when Especially when they come back and kill your dog for no reason whatsoever. I said transparency and that is what I'm giving is transparency. I had a nervous breakdown. I went over the edge. I took a car and a caravan and Four children. One, two, three. Yeah, four children. And I drove to Spain and back again. And looking back on it, I was in no fit state of mind to be travelling 60 miles down the road, let alone from here to Spain and back again. Do I remember the whole journey, the whole period of time we were away? No, I don't. Do I remember how many days we were away? I have no idea. I have recollections of certain parts of that space of period within my life. But none of it is consecutive. There's bits from here and there's bits from there and there's big gaps in between. Will I ever remember those periods of those pieces that are missing? Who knows? It is part of oppressed CP CPTSD. Will those memories come back? As I said, who knows? Do I want them to come back? I'll Google, I'll Google that one and ask Google. Phone a friend, 50-50. Um, it would be interesting to know what went on in that period of my life. Am I at a stage now where I would be able to deal with and comprehend what happened during that period of time, would I be able to stay level-headed without any irrational behaviours or actions due to what was happening or what had happened during that period of time once I find out? No, I will deal with it in the manner in which I de dealt with it so far. I look at the positive things that came out of that and I look at the fact that I'm still here today. To tell the story. Did I manage to get any help from the mental health services for everything that I've gone through? And my answer to that one is no. Due to the fact is that I have no trust in social services in the United Kingdom. I have no trust in child protection services of any country in the world because they are departments that seriously need to be looked at. I looked at ways that I would be able to help improve my own well-being to a point where I wasn't going to be hiding away from the world anymore, to a point where I'd be able to have the power back of my voice. And I believe that using the strategies and techniques that I did allowed me to get to where I am today. I got involved with an organisation, or they got involved with me rather, and I had an amazing support worker in the fact of it wasn't a support worker as in a social worker or a CPN or community mental health nurse or anything like that. This was an organisation that helps you try to take back the empowerment of your life and you know they're there they're working with you 
in that one year that I was with them, we actually produced two events in that year. We produced a summer event and we produced a Christmas event. And the events were centred around supporting other people whose mental well-being was not in a place where it should be and showing them that there are people that are out there that care and who are prepared to do things to assist them. Especially towards the Christmas period when it gets very, very lonely for a lot of people, especially those with mental health and that they live on their own. Having information of places where you can go, people that you can call during that period of time, can be very, very reassuring. Because those are lonely times. But knowing that there are some people out there who are still able to communicate with you just to even have a chat and a cup of coffee, that's a nice feeling. But what was nice was being able to do these events, looking at how I would be able to put what I had gone through, how I had lost everything. I had my own business. I had holidays abroad every year. My business was doing good. I lived in a beautiful house. It took two people to destroy it completely at the end. But it was a pattern of negative behaviours that I'd been drawn into, dragged into. It was those negative paths that I was on that just landed up virtually destroying my life. My daughter and I have an amazing relationship. For a young woman in her early 20s, she has seen a hell of a lot and she's been through a hell of a lot. And to say that she's still here and she's still fighting She's a survivor and she will make it because do you know why? Because when she didn't think that she could make it last week, we're at the end of this week and she's made it. When I haven't thought that I could make it to the next week, guess what? I made it. So there's a determination in there. But things do get better and they get better with the more work and progression that you put into it. I'm now at a stage where I've used the experiences that I've been through in my life to do an online course called It's All About You. And it looks at how and shows you how you can actually change the way that you live your life for more beneficial positivities in your life, more happiness, more get up and go, and more self-worth and self-love. And that's one of the biggest things. If I didn't love myself, and I didn't think that I was worth something, I wouldn't have fought as hard as I've fought all these years running, hiding, taking kids into protective custody, going and safeguarding myself and my family, running to where I've been told to by the domestic violence team, being told that if I don't leave, you're going to take my children away from me. I have done running and hiding and moving and protecting not only myself, but my children and other children. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to protect children, but yet we are also supposed to protect each other and be there for each other. So if at the end of the day, my story 
and my fight to survive to where I am today gets to gets to the point of being a survival kit and a mode for other people then I humbly say please use it and if it's of benefit to you then you do you you go and do it you take back that self-empowerment how did I do this course it started up with the governors why do we call it the governors well it's a very sad story but it's got so much memory and love and joy and lots of giggles and everything about it unfortunately we've had to come to terms and deal with the fact that my mum had my mum Pat had vascular dementia and Alzheimer's and that's just a that's just a completely different kind of emotional ball game going on on that one especially when it gets to the stage where The parent that has that condition doesn't recognise you as their children anymore. That's a hard pill to swallow. Still get a little emotional about it. But it's hardly surprising because... It's just over a year ago, in July last year, that we lost governor number one, Pat. Pat passed away on the 4th of July of 2021. My daughter and I went straight in to start caring for my dad, who was health was ailing pretty badly and had been for many years and he literally looked after my mum right up until the day that she died eight months and one week after we lost my mum I held my dad's hand I stroked his face as he lay unconscious in the bed, surrounded by my daughter, my aunt, my brother, and my sister-in-law. And we said our final goodbyes to Governor Number Two, Malcolm. But Malcolm was a as he would tell you, he would prefer to be a jack of all trades than a master of one. And the first thing was thinking about renovation of a property abroad. And then we sat talking about it. And the idea evolved a little bit more. And then I happened to talk about it to my niece and the idea evolved a little bit more. And it's evolved to the point where now we're doing podcasts. So things do get better. But the reason I brought Malcolm and Pat into it is, especially Malcolm, Malcolm was definitely a jack of all trades. He started off in the Royal Navy. He was an electronics engineer and 
he was very proud of his service within the Royal Navy, in the Fleet Air Arm. But he was a man who was inquisitive, who wanted to learn about things. And once he got his teeth stuck into something and thoroughly enjoyed doing it, he would do it and he would do it damn well. And one of the things that my dad was working on as he was leading up to him passing away was a course on public speaking. Being an avid public speaker and thoroughly enjoying it and a teacher of public speaking. So we evolved that into the course as well. But not fully, just slightly. Because we thought there was bits and pieces within that course that would be of such benefit in It's All About You. So it's a bit of a tragic story and of transparency of the situations and little things that, you know, have brought us to the place that we are today. And we're starting off with the online course. We're just going through the final preparations of the course. Spoke to Bronwyn tonight and Bronwyn's got a couple of things that she wants to change on one of the pages. The font, because you know this old bird, she's not font, font, font knowledge is a no-no. And we're going to get there. But now with the podcast, I'm about to send out some mails to some people who I've been in contact with and I now need to get going and get that part involved as well. Because at the end of the day, what is Governor's World all about? It's all about you. It's all about empowering you, helping you take back the empowerment of your voice, helping you achieve those boundaries and that positive path of life that you want to take and that you want to be on. Is it going to be easy? Nothing in life is easy. You need to work at it. And you only work at it when you want it. So you need to want it and want it really badly to do it. Can you do this? Can you get yourself empowered to the point where when you speak, people actually turn around and listen because of the way that you are using your voice, the way that you are using your appearance and the way that you are using you. My name's Annie. Thank you for joining me. I wish you peace, love and happiness. Don't forget, see you on the next podcast.